This episode of Montreal by Night contains coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome, guys, gals, and non-binary pals to another wonderful episode of Montreal by Night. I am your storyteller, Tyson Fraley. And as always, first up, we've got Ethan Jonah. Uh, Ethan? Hello? Ethan? Ethan? Buddy? You there? Ethan Jonah will sadly not be with us for this episode and with the next episode. Uh, he is up north uh, doing some some camp and stuff and going to have a, a great time. Uh, so sadly, you will be just stuck with two of our three incredible cast members. First and foremost, uh, at the top of the episode, we have our uh, moving from second to first place on the list of... Uh, uh, announced cast members we have brenton edwards hey <laughs> thank you very much Tyson. <sighs> glad to have top billing finally <laughs> uh as always we have our dear boy takashi fukushima hey there everyone hope you're all doing well uh so at which point let us get to our recap last time on montreal by night you guys accomplished a lot you guys traveled to the mayor's home, uh, being able to slip inside. With the help of the mask, you guys were able to meet with Mayor Tremblay and be able to discover a little bit more about what is going on around the city and learned the location of one Monsieur Bouchard. You guys then traveled to Monsieur Bouchard's office, uh, Therapy Coron, where you arrived at the front door uh, and were about to enter before you noticed some sneaking vampires on the other side of the street. Asher then activated his premonition, essentially warning him that you guys were about to walk into the jaws of the beast, whoever this evil of enterprise, uh, the schemer behind everything was doing. You guys uh, had a turbulent moment of deciding who was going to stay and fight against Ambrosia and the incoming gangrel, uh, where Asher was overtaken by a compulsion uh, for per perfectionism, uh, at which point Talison was ready to go out into the fight and start thrashing away when Nakano pulled the most fucking G move ever and staked him in the back, uh, having to bring him inside after you guys were pulled into the elevator with the assistance of Francine or Abigail Bray, depending on who you're talking to. You guys began heading up the elevator, uh, Talison uh, violently shouting at Nakano and Francine before the doors opened, revealing uh, a red-haired gentleman with a goatee uh, speaking to Asher's assistant, Sebastian, and talking about uh, some work that they have apparently done together, some sort of confession. And as this figure has turned towards you and, S and Sebastian has run off into the other direction that is where we left off so the two of you are currently standing in the elevator as you can see the figure before you monsieur bouchard just kind of standing there very elegant but business casual attire just looking to you both well the elevator is not going to wait there forever i will start walking towards him Talison is, is still in a semi state of semi semi frenzy, I guess. He's not very happy, uh, but he'll he'll recognize that this is important enough to try and rein himself in. So he'll very slowly put down Francine slash Bray and. Deep breaths. Try and collect himself and and walk in. Got his got his guitar and his sword. Sort of back in. Oh, sorry, he's, he's he's got his sword uh, stashed back in the in the neck of his guitar, and he's walking walking t uh, out to Mich uh, Monsieur Bouchard. You see, uh, Bouchard kind of looks towards Francine as she kind of drops and hit the hits the floor. She's kind of. I'll, I'll say, Talison, make a uh, make a quick awareness check. 
three? Three? Okay. Uh, you let go of uh, Francine. As she hits the ground, you can see she goes to rub her neck, but you see no red marks. You see no almost like sign of impact, which definitely suggests to you that no blood vessels were broken when you held her up. Which suggests she's a kindred. I'll just, I'll look at her. Give it, de- definitely give her a death stare before um, turning to uh, Bouchard and, and saying, so how many other kindred do you have on the payroll? Mm, not as many as one might think. But, well, I'm sure that there's lots you'll want to go over beyond just this. Am I correct? A conversation would be preferred, yes. Knowledge is power, as they say. Of course. Uh, in which case, uh, you can see uh, Bouchard kind of looks over to to Francine Ab- slash Abigail. We'll just call her Francine for now. He just kind of looks at her. Uh, if there's any appointments from now till the foreseeable future, just make sure to mark it down and I'll speak to them later. Uh, this is a bit of a important arrangement. Out of curiosity, where's Asher? Occupied. Oh. Hmm. Outside. Is that the madness that I heard? <laughs> Gunshots ring loud here. Occupied. Sure, sure. To my office, then. And he kind of just motions to a door just behind the desk. You mean you had nothing to do with the congregation outside? Mm, I mean, not actively. Look, this is all stuff that we can cover. But you want to have a conversation? Let's just get comfortable. Fine! I would be comfortable right out here, if you don't mind. Are you certain? Is there is there somewhere to sit? Are there, are, is it just like a, a standard, like, lot lobby? To get a kind of a visual of, of where you are, it's... It's a very stark room that you're you're currently in. It, it's it's something that as you're looking around, it's not that it was put together quickly, but there's not a lot of like homeliness to it. There you're currently just stepping into a small, what essentially looks to be a hallway foyer, with a desk in the center, and a single doorway that leads on the left hand side what looks to be into a room on the right you can see it leads into a hallway with a door that uh it seems to be composed out of metal and it has like those um like the glass sheeting like the glass windows with the oh what is that called the like wire inlets essentially making it much more difficult to break the glass. Uh, And you can see that is down the hall. Uh, You do see that there is a key card uh, lock that is on there uh, that you kind of look down and you can see back of uh, Sebastian as he seems to be walking down the hallway. From our friend, Bouchard, using uh, my recently acquired heightened senses, can I hear things like heartbeat or grinding of joints or anything to indicate that he is mortal? Um, I'll say make a make an intelligence medicine check. Can I add my aspects to it? Sure. <laughs> One success. Hard to tell. Maybe this guy is mortal. I'll tell you what, since you want to be so comfortable, uh, why don't you go and get one of your probably many assistants to go and get you a chair? See, he looks to you both. Looks to Francine. Would you mind a chair behind my desk and grab the two sofa chairs? I'm sure that uh, they've had a hard night. See, Francine just kind of gives a little nod before she walks into the office he just stands there 
I hear you're some sort of psychiatrist. Therapist. You know, it's a universal thing needing to confess. I had a job once where such things were much less faux pas. You didn't need to pay. If anything, at this point, I I do my best to do it without uh, having money get in the way. Can I, uh, can I sense the beast on him? I need you to please make a resolve plus animalism check. That is three successes with a crit success on a blood die. Okay. You activate sense the beast, trying to penetrate into this man's psyche, trying to form into his physicality. As your focus goes outward, as it strikes him, you feel... It it almost feels like a shield that impacts as it touches his body, spreading influence all around him where you actually can't sense anything. I feel like this is new to me, so I'm going to like literally stagger a step back. At which point Francine comes back uh, with one of the leather chairs and sets it in front of you, Nakano. Seems that <laughs> your long journey has led you here. It looks like you could uh, use a little rest. For Francine brings the next chair from behind his desk as he sets it down. Yeah, I'll I'll sit down. I'll I'll sit, but as I'm sitting, I'll say, "Your use of the term confess infers a religious connection." Father, Bishop, what was your previous title? Oh, I had a few. I had a few. Care to elaborate then? Long time ago. What? Sixteen hundreds? Seventeen hundreds? Fifteen hundreds? At a certain point, you just start losing track of time. Kind of becomes worthless to imagine that. I'm mostly at this point just measure through places. Spans of time that I lived one place, moved to another. It's a bit of a an art to a certain extent. As I'm sure the both of you are aware, having to come into a new place reestablish yourselves from nothing. It's exhausting, but there is a certain level of beauty to it. Don't know what you're talking about. With a, like, eye roll. Which point the the seat is brought to you, Talison, so you can you can uh, sit easy as Francine heads back towards her desk. Which point uh, Bouchard kind of sits down in his chair. So, Nakano, Talison. I have to say, right off the top, before we go into anything, I'm impressed by your work. Tasson will just raise an eyebrow. Like, nothing on else in his face will move but the eyebrow, and he'll just keep staring. I suppose I just want to preface everything, our little conversation, by saying that I am impressed. And I do greatly admire your work. It's clear that you've put a lot of thought and effort into what you have decided to accomplish. Thank you for the compliment, Mr. Bouchard. Um, was that in reference to our recent accomplishments? Or more than overall, you're trying to butter us up or something? Mm, I mean, I can't speak to anything as of tonight. I did get a little text a little while, not too, too long ago from uh, the dear mayor. Quite agitated. But I suspect if that was you even more dockets to add to the list. He seems to think quite highly of your sessions together. Hmm. I suppose it does have an effect. Like I said, confession. Doesn't matter if you make people pay money for it or they come of their own free will or if they don't. It's a necessary part of human life. It's always the most interesting, I find. And what does this mayor tend to confess? Oh. Frivolity. At least amongst our kind. You know, the hidden pleasures. Minor dismays at living. 
the little things that really don't matter in the grand scheme. I just thought he was coming for a little drink, to be honest. Isn't that what you do with your blood bonds? Your, um, sorry, not blood bonds. What's, uh... Uh, technically speaking, it is a blood bond. It is, it is a blood bond, okay. With your, uh, with your, your thralls, your blood bonds. I don't... Hmm. How do I word this? There are some things more powerful in this world than just our own vitae. And I will admit that it helps. It's a great assistance. But it isn't everything that their kind needs. I think there are greater things that people like him, people like the mayor, the other people who come here, there are greater things that they need than me just cutting open my hand and bleeding into their mouths. That's how you develop the fanatics, the obsessed. But obsession, the obsession leads to envy, which leads to pride, and thus pride before the fall. We certainly have had a great fall in this city recently. As much as I am a fan of uh, roundabout conversation and chit-chats. I'm here to answer any questions that you have. Why the hell would you attack the Kindred's stronghold here? Please give us a reason as to why you brought upon this, this violence. I did not attack the stronghold. Not personally. Mm, I mean, of course not personally. One who, re one who plays chess realizes that the king, while not in the front lines himself, definitely controls the pawns. Well, let me phrase it another way. Why do you think the people attacked the theater? What do you think the cause was? You said you would answer any question. I asked a question. I am. And this is an unorthodox way of answering it, but... Yes, it's a way of answering it which gets you, or gets us to provide you information that we would normally would not have been providing you. Thus realizing what we know, so, thus revealing what we know and what we do not know, so just stop playing the games, tell us why you orchestrated the attack against the theater. I'm trying to answer your question. I can't answer a question without the right information. You might be able to tell me outright. And if you tell me outright, then I'll say yes, that was exactly what it was. All right. I will play your game. I think that you staged that attack. You orchestrated it. Because you feel that the current leadership in this city is lackluster. And you think the people have been led astray. Have fallen into... What did you say of the mayor? Little indiscretion that need to be corrected through the proper guidance of a of an individual. Am I close? Kind of looks over to you, Talison. Does that sound about right to you? Talison will stay silent. He'll, he'll just be staring at him. He does not he's he does not want to give anything away. He's he's regressed back to the stage where he trusts very little and so he's not he's not prepared to give away any information that will put him in further danger okay which point he looks from talison then looks back to you nakano so to answer your assertion outright you are somewhat on the money the only trouble was is who you think is leading this i didn't command them to do anything the leadership in the city failed and was overtaken by people who already have had the inclination. They already knew what they wanted to do. I simply was here as a, a wandering ear. They took violence into their own hands to kill our kind because that they saw that there was no other answer. They saw that what was going on was unjust and they wanted to change it. Now, can I say to their motives, well, pff, that could be here nor there. But I assume, based on your works previous, you're already aware of Ambrosia and with Esther. And Ambrosia, I will admit, she's a bit more <laughs> fickle. 
she seems to always assume she's holding the cards when she doesn't realize that, well, that there are other players. But Esther, Esther was interesting. She, she was alone and tired. She saw an opportunity that her clan had just been, been given Morel as a, a passing gesture. And she knew that. It was a political move. It wasn't because anyone actually cared about her, and she felt alone. So, she was consulted to me. We had a conversation, and she was able to be enlightened. See, that is what all I do. I'm simply a man of talking. Perhaps I talk too much. But like I said, and your friend Talison has already asserted, confession does a lot of good for people. Sometimes it's nice just to have someone listen. Yes, but you don't only listen, do you? Are you trying to tell me that you are the one putting these people together, putting these forces in motion, yet you don't take any culpability for it? I understand your frustration, Nakano. I'm not going to sit here and say that I held no responsibility, because that would be a lie. I simply consider myself more to be the wind at the back of destiny. A kingmaker, a power broker. Mm, harsh words to use, but I suppose if such was were a thing. But I do not believe in kingmaking. Well, forgive me for my lack of uh, kind words at present. This um, wind you put in people's sails may well have cost my friend his life, so I am not as open to the niceties of conversation as I would normally be. That's a fair point. Uh, Francine, do you mind calling Esther? Make sure that that one's alive. Um, <clears throat> I just know that if your friends outside, uh, the ones that you think that I twisted and mangled, had their chance and had their option, they would probably kill your friend, but that's too barbaric for me. Plus, also, I'm deeply fascinated by your friend. He seems to be the most bookish sort. All right. You'll, you'll see uh, Talison will sort of, his posture will relax just a little. He'll release a little of the tension that he's uh, he's holding now that, that there is the chance that uh, Asher will, will be alive after this. So... You say Esther was enlightened. What did you say to enlighten her? I simply listened to her feelings, to her feelings of insecurity. She said she was feeling alone. I simply offered that maybe the future that she saw of her deep loneliness, of her pain, perhaps it wasn't as stark as she thought. All to say, small steps to a brighter future for her. Who were the soldiers who went to the Conclave? Well, I suppose they were eager initiates. It seems your community has pissed off quite a few of uh, the members of, well, the big bad Second Inquisition. It seems that you mocked them after defeating them, which feels in bad taste. Which point, it wasn't particularly hard. Simply asked around a little bit, found a bunch of disgruntled agents that after a catastrophic failure were eager to not have to worry about, oh, simple things as directives and orders. Simply slaughter. Right, so essentially you motivated the disenfranchised to commit violence on your terms as opposed to the Second Inquisition's terms. You took advantage of their dislike to our kind, conveniently not alerting them that you also are of our kind, and directed them to a position that would destroy our leadership, slake their bloodlust, and put Esther and uh, Ambrosia in a position where they could take up power. Well, you watched on with the glass of, uh, glass of blood. Enjoyed this show at the theater, as it were. You could consider it a show, but again, I'm not someone who's playing pu puppeteer. I didn't send those people. Then what do you want out of this? 
Why motivate these people at all for a good show? What do you get out of this? Well, to answer all of your questions, I'll have to take them in parts. For the first part, in my years doing my work and for a very long time, I was who Esther was. I was lost, lost inside my own community, as I'm sure the two of you were, as all of early kindred kind are. We're turned into something against our will, twisted. We are introduced to a world that is cold, unfeeling, and thus we begin a chess match, or <laughs> at least that's what Camarilla would like us to believe. But that kind of existence, it wore away at me. I couldn't stand watching our kind getting slaughtered the way that it did. Over something as what? Pitiful as land? As power? Truly, this was our decision. That we were going to send armies and legions to go and kill each other for the sake of a small bit of grain, iron, diamond, oil today. This is where our future is. No wonder humanity has come to a, see a scourge upon itself. See, it is nothing more than this world is a pile of ashes in the making. I don't blame them. So after all my years, I've decided that to be a bit of an antithesis to the Camarilla. I do not force anyone to do anything. I am simply a man of choices. I offer choices. I simply offer people to move to plan A, perhaps, if that is what is best for them. Plan B, perhaps. And I never assert my own dominance here. I always just listen to their needs and act accordingly. Because that, at the end, is, well, it's what a mentor is. To answer your second question, why do I give a damn? Why throw myself into the middle of all of it? Well, the answer is simple yet complex. After a very long time being lost on my own, I became so filled with self self-loathing that every time I would awake from my toper, I'd look for another reason to be as embarrassing as it is staked, blown apart temporarily. I would rest off my wounds and then awaken another day. And this went on for a number of decades, perhaps even a century. And through that painful, unending, unceasing living, I saw that same pain in so many others. Thus I decided to, after a while, stop running from what I was and try to understand it on a fundamental level. And science and doctors, well, they're one thing. There was a time when we didn't put such devotion into such small things. But at the time, I thought it was worthwhile. Grave digging, stealing corpses, surgery, autopsy. Learning what made us fundamentally man, mortal. And I found nothing. But no matter what I would come back to, I would be left awash, not knowing where to go next. And the irony, of course, stands that it was only till I found a different book, a book that would change my life forever. And he steps up and he goes over to Francine, and you see Francine has just gotten off the phone as she kind of sets it down and just kind of gives uh, Bouchard a nod before he opens a drawer and pulls out a black book. You can see it's leather bound. Uh, looks like it's been well worn as he sits down with it. It's so interesting that people look to the Bible as a sign of divinity against our kind. Yet they seem to not understand that Jesus himself was of our kin. <laughs> Well, how else could you explain someone rising after three days? Arising after three days? Allow me to 
give you the blood and flesh of my own body? And people understand these as metaphors. It's kind of silly that they don't see it as more. You would have thought that somebody would come across that, given the religious back, backing of the Inquisition. You would think so. But apparently people are too busy looking for what they want to find, as opposed to what is there. Human trappings. Or mortal trappings. Even of our kind. In the beginning, I did not want to see what was in there. Perhaps it was the childish nature of trying to run away from my own kin, not face myself. But it wasn't until I read it in full that I fully understood. And then I ended up reading it again and again, comfort food to a mind in despair. And afterwards I began to look into more texts. The Book of Nod, other religions based around our community, the understandings of Cain, the situation of Abel and Cain's ascension towards the city of Enoch. After a lot of soul searching that it occurred to me unity was what we needed. That things like the Camarilla, the Anarchs, all of them, they create divisions between us. It's enterprising and it's made and designed for us to hate each other but to fundamentally to hate ourselves. That's what it is at the end of the day. This entire system, this entire government, the Anarchs, the Camarilla, even the Sabbat. God, the Sabbat. But before I get into that spiral, every single one of them was made to make sure that by the end of the day, you hated you. Because you were always at the whims of someone else. And the Anarchs, they try to profess independence. But come on, they have people named barons. I don't think you can really go around saying, we are the finest institution in, in a democratic system, and then have different districts owned by different baronies. It's a bit of an ironic twist. What would you prefer? They'd be called presidents? Premiers? No, it goes deeper than that. I simply fundamentally want all of our kind to understand that we are something special. And to what? Follow you? To give, uh, do you wish to give the kindred kind that unity? God, no. <laughs> By no means. I do not have the wisdom for that. But there is someone who does. At least I believe. Go on. Who do you believe has the wisdom for this? There is an old adage that says, through pain comes wisdom. The more pain you experience, the more wise you can become from learning from your mistakes. I think from my clan, the missing point of that is non-intentional. Sometimes hard lessons need to be learned, the old-fashioned way. But wisdom is obtained by making mistakes that you made honestly, not mistakes that were thrust upon you. It also comes with age, with understanding. Sometimes we lose that sort of wisdom, but not always. When we have something to drive for, Cain was a man who understood that. He suffered pain not because he intentionally did it upon himself, but because he was willing to make the sacrifices at finding his freedom. The Lord punished him after killing Abel, but the Lord did not fundamentally understand what he was doing. God makes mistakes. Everyone does. So that's who I would suggest. You would suggest Cain would lead that. Cain is in slumber. That's what the war is in the Middle East. That's what they are all about, you know. The antediluvians are warring amongst each other. There are people trying to find Cain. There is. But also no one would confess if, if he were alive and they saw him. It would be a great uh, admission of weakness, would it not? And even if he was sleeping, it is always possible to awaken our kind. 
We simply must make the right show and show him that we have arrived at his great vision. To show him that we are no longer afraid to hide in the dark. That kindred should stand out just as much as with them, the humans, the rest of them. And showing what we truly are, our beauty, our the next step to face divinity. Like I said, Jesus himself was one of our kin. Who of the mortals of this world would not give everything to be that same Messiah? Why crumble ourselves when we could bring an age of recognition, of love to our community and grow it? Why must there be strictly humans in this world? Why are they not simply children about to meet the face of us, benefactors and fathers? That is what I would consider the Cain's sign. The sign that his children are ready to meet him. Did you have anything to do with Frederick Lake? It was a painful experience. Truly painful. Tell us. I had no pleasure in killing her. That's the thing. When all the dust is settled, I hope that we all understand that I'm not doing this because I think... that I think it's pleasurable. I hate doing this. And for... that Ravnos girl truly was a shame. I could imagine that she was going to become something great one day. But she made her choices. She jumped someone in the middle of the night, simply was not strong enough to overtake me, and thus Frederick needed to be illuminated. So you did slaughter that family. Pin it on the Ravnos girl. Set Frederick Lake on his path. I showed Frederick what life for our kind is right now. I showed him what it means to be a kindred now, so he would understand that he would want to change those things. So you turned him, starved him, made him think it was the Ravnos girl, got him to slaughter his own family in his bloodlust, and hates kindred kind. You were the one that set that in action. Like it or not, don't beat around the bush, as they say in the modern times. You did it. I turned him. I sat him down and I talked to him. And then it sadly led to him being starved, yes. You're so full of shit. You goddamned coward. You talk about love and you butcher innocence. You talk about divinity, and yet you turn a man on his own family. You defame the barons, and yet you would hand us over to the greatest baron of all. You talk about mortals like they are zealots, and yet I see nothing but a zealot before me. You say you want to bring vampires into the light. However, bringing new children into darkness is not the way to do this. You say you want to end the pain, and yet you are creating pain to do so. And not just creating new children, but in in ways that are against our laws of the present. My own creation was against the laws hundreds of years ago. And even then, they had the, the, the common sense to punish the person who did that. What you've done with Frederick Lake is already against our laws. And those laws were created by people who wanted to keep us down. There are better ways. There are better ways to create good in the world. I think you have been in pain. You're trying to find a way out of that pain. You're not doing it right. There will not be a... If you bring us into the light, firstly... Because for us to be the next steps... It will mean humans need to die. Humans are afraid of death. 
Whoever said that humans need to die, Talison? They need to be embraced. All of them. What clan were you? What clan are you? I was always told I lacked subtlety. I want to hear you say it. I was turned in a church, if that gives you any indication. La Sombra. Turned by La Sombra, then took centuries to find the Bible. Yes, even I can appreciate the irony behind that. Then where does this go from here, Mr. Bouchard? Where do things end here in Montreal? They end with peace. They end with a signal, a shine, a star amongst dark waters to show that we are a beacon of what is to come. And so you do this by putting a power-hungry ambrosia at the head of the city. And Esther, who is lonely. And for someone who desires companionship, you placed her with a manipulative Nosferatu. Do you have so little faith in our kind? Do you not think that we will stand up when the time is right? Even Ambrosia, for the cunning woman that she is, doesn't seem to understand that her arrogance only gets her so far. When she has shown our kind her true colors, she will be sent skittering under whatever rock she started in. You think you know all of us so well, don't you? You think you know what's best for all of us. It's all right up there in your little head. All the answers to the things that are plaguing the kindred. I'm not going to say that I know every experience of every kindred, but if everyone could stand up for themselves, we would be in a much better world. What do you want from us? You spoke in admiration of our activities. Yes, I was saying I was impressed. Not very many people have found me. So what do you want from us? This discussion, what is your objective at the end of it? Do you want us to be your servants in this war? Do you want to at least give us a little bit of enlightenment before you kill us and get on with your schemes? Well, do you mean for us to kill you and take over? What is it that you're... What, what do you want from us here? I simply want you to be free. To make the choices that you wish, I'm simply providing information. Like I said, I listen. I speak. But I am a man of choice. So, if you want to continue going to war, fighting this battle of faiths, then you may do so. But, if you're willing to wait, to see what kind of beautiful thing that we can make, a world where we don't have to hide, then perhaps you would just simply step off to the side. Or, if you wanted to stand by my side, not a servant, that is not how I would view your assistance. The choice is up to you. I once tried to stand off to the side many centuries ago. And it's what landed me here. So I don't think I'm going to repeat it. So instead I'm going to ask you this, Mr. Bouchard. If we choose to fight against Esther and Ambrosia, perhaps you could enlighten us as to what they are planning next and how we should stop it. Talison, I would like you to please make an intelligence plus resolve check for me. Oh, dang! Thank you for coming! Four. Six successes. Including, so one of those was a crit. Throughout this entire conversation, as he was talking to you and essentially just going on this long monologue about his beliefs, there were definitely times as he was talking, you were feeling a pull. A certain level of almost like a hook drawing your focus in this little voice at the back of your head maybe he is right am i really as self-hating as to believe in all this stuff 
will I ever really accomplish anything good that Asher seems to want to accomplish? Will war ever be impossible with our kind? Is this potentially a way of saving everyone, myself? And you can feel those barbs kind of latching into your focus before you feel your focus come back to your control by the end of the conversation. And you don't feel that pull anymore. Which point, Bushad just looks to the both of you. So, is that it then? So, if we were then to stand at your side, what would that entail exactly? It would entail a number of things moving forward. To say I have all of the steps mapped out, you put too much... Uh, you place too much talent on me. I have ideas. And what are those ideas? I'm... And I'll, I'll sort of shoot a look at Nakano and say, I found myself in company I'm not sure I can trust anymore. I would like you to make either a manipulation persuasion check, if you're being honest, or a manipulation subterfuge check if you're being dishonest. I don't want you to tell me what your role is that you're choosing here. Uh, and I'm going to have him roll an insight check. We're going to make this a wits insight check on his behalf to see if he's able to see through either your honesty or your deception. Okay, so I'm going to keep this. I'm going to keep this real brief. Um, he's not quite sure yet. He's. On like on because on on one hand he believes that he's he he doesn't believe he's he's entirely correct in his belief system, but on the other hand he wants someone that he can trust that is not going to stab him in the back. Uh, do you want to make it? Do, do you want to make a wits insight check? to determine how much of like honesty or l like be able to sense anything about his speech and how he's conversing with you five for wits insight with five you're able to understand everything this man says is honest like there's a certain level of desperation hiding underneath he's trying to persuade you but he also isn't lying in saying that if you guys decide to leave, that's your own choice. Also, when you hear him talk about mortals and humans, there is a certain level of condescension in his voice, a very passing level, this almost like almost not fully looking at them as people. Like he almost seems to treat them like children to where your guys' position is. Though that's the amount that you're able to discern. Okay. Even though he is trying to dominate me. Very yes, it, it definitely is clear that he that he tried to influence you in some way. But there's no active like trying to actively deceive you about his intentions. So he wants us he wants us enough to Dom, you know, to, to influence us outside of just persuasion, but he also does want us to believe him. Uh, it seems that way, yes. Okay, good to know. All right. Uh, I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna roll the willpower. I got five successes. You see he looks over at you, Talison. Kind of eyes you up and down. This is a difficult moment for you, Talison. I can tell. What gives this away? The fact that I trashed your elevator? That I almost strangled your assistant? That's still trying to, try, still trying to figure out whether to join you, gut you, or eat your assistant. What, give it, what, what gave it away, huh? 
I cannot promise you an answer as of the moment about what, ne what comes next. Because genuinely, I don't know. And I'm not going to hide that from you. Your honesty is appreciated. What I can say for certain is that you don't have to do anything you don't want to. And I can say you have the right to choose to leave. Like I said, choice. But if you think that what I can offer here is amenable, an opportunity, I would simply ask that you have faith. How much do you know about me and my history, Bouchard? I know a little bit. Do you know my thoughts on loyalty then? I can assume based on your demeanor. Plus also, if anyone came from Anastasia, I think they have a very in-depth understanding of what it means to be us. At the mention of, of that name, Talison's going to sort of push himself up and then start pacing. He's just going to start pacing around behind his couch, behind the Kano's and back again. How do you know of that name? You start to learn names, being as old as I am. I wasn't there, I was a little bit farther away, but I knew of her. And I'm sorry. Based on what I heard, she got everything she deserved. She deserved far worse than what she got. She took everything from me. She betrayed me and turned me into this. I do not look kindly upon betrayal. And so if I were to join you, I must know. I need to make sure I will never be betrayed again. And he's, as, he's, as he's saying this, he's pacing, he's starting to pace faster. There's, you, you can see this a lot weighs on the answer. And he's getting more and more impatient, more and more agitated again when, he, when he's speaking of, of, of this betrayal. This, this, this isn't something he's addressed, really, for his entire time as a, as a kindred. As you're moving around, see he stands up from his seat and walks around your side of the chair, Talison. Not getting too close to you, but just standing at the end. Allow me to counter your words with something I heard you say. She betrayed you. She stabbed you in the back. That I cannot deny. Because that's what she did. But you said that she turned you into this. And you say it with such contempt. I had no choice in the matter. I was her slave for years. You were. And that was someone else's choice. And it is terrible, the things that she has done. But before me, I see something more than what she wanted to make you into. You took every pain and hardship she threw at you, and you made something beautiful. You are something beautiful, Talison. It is frivolous to throw beauty away. As I'm pacing, um, I'll, I'll get, into, get near to Nakano again. And as I'm near Nakano, I'll grab him by the, the sort of the scruff of his neck and I'll lift him again. I'll lift him and I'll hold him in front of um, the, the uh, in front of Boucher. So there's basically Boucher, uh, Nakano being held upwards and then myself. And I look at him and you can see I'm just like, my face is full of anguish. And I'm like, he recognizes this. I was your friend. Why can you not? And I'll, as I'm holding him with one hand, I'll reach into his jacket and I'll grab the steak and I'll grab the heart. Does Nakano say anything to me while I'm holding him up, pilfering the stuff from him? 
You know, that's a damnably good question. Um, no, I think he's going to remain silent and see how this plays out. So I'm so so I'm holding him up. You you're just you're just looking at me. Is that right? Yeah. All right. I'll I'll make a show of having the stake in my hand. I know you intended to use this. I'll not, however, make a show of having the heart. That's something I want to uh, to to be a little bit mums the word on. But I'll pull out I'll pull out the stake. I know you intended to use this. But I'm sorry, my friend. I cannot let you. And I'm staring him in the eyes. And I'll, I'll as, as I say this, I'm so, I'll say, but I learned about honor from you. I can't have you using this. And then I'll get, I'll get Nakano and I'll just throw him to the floor so he slides towards the elevator. And I'll walk around behind the conductor and I'll go down, I'll put, put my hands behind my back, and I'll stand almost like I'm at attention. At which point, as you approach him, he just looks at the stake and just offers his hand out. And then I'll toss it away from the Kano, away from him, towards the door. At which point he nods, puts his hand back. Nakano, if you take some time to reconsider, simply come back. I have a feeling things will be moving quite quickly over the next few days. And at that moment, I try and drain Boucher. Okay. I would like you to first make a dexterity check. This uh, this is essentially your reaction time versus Abigail's. Oh, uh, can I can I also get in there? Because when 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 I'd see Talison going to drain Bouchard. When I see that, I would probably grab my gun and aim at um, Abigail slash Francine. Okay. Uh, please uh, just make a quick dexterity check just to see what order you guys are going to move in. Okay. Um, once again, can I use uh, fleetness or rapid reflexes or both in relation to this? Actually, it would be fleet. It would be fleetness because add the celerity rating to a user's dice pool for non-combat dexterity tests. Once per turn, the user may also do this when defending with dex dexterity athletics. Uh, essentially, what I'm what I'm offering is if you want to bite him, it, it, it's either as your action per this round, is you can either bite him or you can activate fleetness. So if you wanted to activate your initiative, you can get a huge head start if you activate fleetness this round, or you can get the jump on him and bite him at a slight disadvantage to your initiative. I like to bite him now. I want to get the jump on him as much as possible. Okay. So uh, please roll for your general decks. Uh, I got four successes, one of those being a messy critical. Uh, okay, so you, you fire before uh, Abigail does. All right, I'm going to use my... Um, willpower to re-roll four of those dice. So that's six successes. Six successes. Okay. You go before uh, Bouchard and you also go before Abigail shoots. So you go for your bite. Please make a... We're going to have to make this a strength brawl check. That's not good. <laughs> uh, I got a two. <laughs> two successes. Oh, Christ. Okay. You whoosh, drive down to bite into his flesh as you impact slightly as your fangs embed into his palm as he catches the upper part of your jaw with his hand and pushes back, kind of scenting your head, like shooting backwards to re-go into your stance as Bouchard just kind of turns to you. And we were going to do so many beautiful things together. I will never be kept again! You try to dominate me! You try to manipulate my mind! I do not believe your bullshit! Wait, okay. Uh, I need you to please make a dex athletics check. Three successes. Three successes. 
you take four points of superficial damage as you, as he slams his fist beneath your gut as you feel all the air. <laughs> Uh, which point it is now Nakano. Nakano, you level the gun at Abigail. As you see from her desk, you can see she pulls out uh, what looks to be a, like, sawed off, what almost looks to be a double barrel shotgun that she has pulled up into one hand and is aiming towards Talison. Uh, it is your go. Yeah, I'm going to take the shot on her and I will be using the incendiary rounds I got from Prism. Okay, go for it. That is five successes. Uh, She takes two points of aggravated damage. She's going to make a willpower check to overcome fire frenzy, uh, and she just succeeds. So she is not overwhelmed by the fear of the fire as it impacts into her body, uh, at which point she turns, looks to Unicano, levels the shotgun, and uh, uh, sends bullets flying towards you. So I need you to now please make a dexterity athletics check. That is three successes. You take five points of aggravated damage as the uh, shotgun explodes in front of you. You watch as the pellets ignite in flame as they embed into your chest. Just quick question about damage because with that amount of superficial damage, uh, I am now at 10 points of... Oh, that was 5 points of aggravated damage? Aggravated damage. Okay, um... So- sorry, I I just need a quick refresher on how the different damage types work. So, I, I have not lost all of my superficial damage points yet. I have lost all of my aggravated damage points at this point. Okay, so essentially what happens is, is that it's cumulative... So what it means is that however many dots you have is your health bar. So superficial damage simply takes a half point away from your health bar, as it were. Aggravated damage takes a full bar away. So they're not two distinct things. They're the same bar. It's just how much damage you're subtracting per different kind of damage. Uh, But you mentioned that you are currently at zero health currently, right? Yeah, between my superficial and my aggravated, there is no doubt that I am out of health. Okay, so in this case, you do not die. You are you enter Topur, so it means you're unconscious. So as you take the blast, you are thrown backwards, smash into the wall, hit the ground, and as you kind of look over towards Abigail as she begins slinging two more shells in, you can't help but look towards Bouchard and to Talison as you just lie back and just feel yourself drift into unconsciousness. Um, and, and the way that vampire unconsciousness works, like, is it like regular unconsciousness? I'm just blacked out and I'm not aware of anything? For the most part, it depending on the kind, so like, essentially when your health is reduced to zero, it's like very much like a full blackout, full unconsciousness. Like, when you're staked through the chest, it's you can still see everything at first, but everything slowly becomes more and more hazy. So it becomes harder to figure out what's going on around you the longer that you're staked for. But for this specific instance, it's just black. Okay. Uh, so, it now goes to Talison, your, your turn, as you hear this loud, resounding blast. As you look over and you can see Nakano lying near the elevator his body beginning to go slack and relaxed as you watch as little bits of fire are beginning to burn up the side of his clothing, which, you know, if you leave that flame to keep going, it will burn him to cinders. As soon as I spot that, despite everything, despite the fact that he stabbed me in the back, at the end of the day, he's still my mate. And so he, uh, Talison is not going to take this very well. So he's he's turning around. He's going to look at, at Nakano and just for a second, then he's going to he's going to yell out, "Roy, no!" And he's going to blink straight to Roy, and he's going to uh, grab him up in in one hand and just sort of and cradle his body 
to to Talison's chest. Uh, how how far is he in relation to the elevator and the stake? The elevator's right there. The doors are currently closed. However, I will say, one thing you do clock is that on the other side, where you were standing near Bouchard, there's a window that drops into outside. It would be like a four-story drop, but it's an option. Uh, I will also say, because you're putting Nakano to your chest, you extinguish the flames on his chest, I'll say, you smother it. I will say you do take one point of aggravated damage because you you do begin to burn slightly from the fire. I'll I'll just I'll just be holding him. I'll have that really caged animal look, and I'll 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 just say to uh, to Bouchard, you stay away from me, stay away from my friends. This wouldn't have happened if you tried to enslave my mind. You know this was a bad idea. You knew that going in, and you still tried it. Stay away! Do this and you may survive. And then I'll just blink right out the window. You run right past him as you break from the window as it shatters into multiple pieces as you please make a dexterity athletics check. Uh, five. Okay. You superhero land in the center of the concrete street as you're holding Nakano <laughs> no damage taken as you pull yourself up holding Nakano uh, and where are you running um, are there any humans nearby at uh, this point in the night not that you're really saying no what time is it uh, it's a, I believe if memory serves it's getting around 2 a.m. so it's not far to it's not gonna be far to find people because you are right near Saint Laurent, and you're also right near Old Port. I am just booking it from cover to cover as quick as humanly possible until I see someone carrying carrying the car the entire time. Okay. And with that note, we're going to take a nice little step uh, to see what Asher's up to. So, Asher, there's only darkness for a little bit you remember running you remember firing up towards the rooftops the scattered shadows dancing and weaving across the pursuit the chase then you remember the flood suddenly the figures closer upon you the attempt to move and dash but suddenly overwhelmed bound something deep dug through the back of your chest and into your heart and you could see it first but after a lot of time passes it kind of just begins to move into blur colors shapes but no real awareness no real perception you feel your movement you feel your feet being dragged being laid down in some sort of hard metal sheeting it's hard to say then rumbling the world beneath you shaking as you feel yourself move not too far you feel yourself once again pulled out hushed tones whispers nothing distinct but sinister nonetheless the asphalt and rock ground beneath your feet slowly shifts into tile wood a descent stairs then stone again then a chair you feel yourself gently set upon it your feet wrists bound your body bound to it you don't know how much time has passed and you can't you can't begin to calculate any of it it just feels like swimming and you don't remember when the stake was pulled out maybe it was the exhaustion the pain having just entered entered topor just out of reaction the need for some sort of rest as you begin to open your eyes the light is dim here but still sufficient 
The room you find yourself in is gray. Old brickwork that is set up on all sides. A flat stone floor. Dust. A fair amount of it. You're kind of sweeping your head side to side and it, it almost looks like an excavation in a strange way. But there are no tools. There are guardrails to a certain extent. It almost looks like being in a strange mixture of an excavation and a museum. Dim lights kind of shine out of the corners of the room, casting shadows. However, from those shadows, you can see that there is one person sitting across from you. Similar chair, but not bound. Reddish hair up top, a slight Monte Cristo, and just seems to be holding a book in front of them. Just kind of looking down, kind of looking up towards you, then looking back down again. Is it Asher's book that Lake gave him? No. Uh, this is what looks to be just a uh, relatively old-looking red, like almost leather, but it's hard to tell exactly. It's definitely a bound book, but it's old, crumpled around the edges, and you can definitely see there's words printed in it. As the man just kind of looks down to the page... And the Lord put his mark on Cain, so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away in the presence of the Lord, and settled into the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city, and named it Enoch after his son Enoch. What do you think of forgiveness, Asher? I'm not sure, Harbinger, Trumpeter. But that is who you have to be. Please. Father John is fine. Now, you, you see, you're... You are a man of... Of learning. That Thus, I was able to deduce a bookshop. Very interesting choice. I, I'm curious. You set up right next to a church, and... Is it irony, or... A view of something else? I suppose it could be perceived as irony. Certainly, part of the decision was to appear as an oddity within my community, to be unobserved, to be left alone. And yet, I visited often the doors left open no true faith there to keep me away i know that you were in possession of the book of nod frederick's copy i'm curious if you had time to read it i'm afraid not uh well we often read something when it's too late anyway i mean i didn't read this <laughs> when i first came to be but you know, there are great nuggets in within here. I'd never expected it. What version are you reading? Oh, this was just a coffee. It's, uh... Was it New Revised Standard? Something I picked up when I, uh, was coming up north again. And when you became what, Father John? When I became part of something bigger than myself. At the time, I didn't understand my place. I thought it was twists and guides of fate, but... When something is pushing you in the direction of fate, you can quarrel and squabble as much as you want about coincidence and damn chance. But in the end, I don't think it matters that much. 
You simply are a chosen. And yet, are you chosen by yourself or by something more? If ever you had a choice at all. I think in the beginning, I believe that it was myself. But that's a part of why I think all of this is so unnecessary. And ultimately, the faith that we have in ourselves is so futile. It's all flesh. It's all just... Aging. Diseased. But a man can become more. Cain did. So, perhaps it is led by myself, but... I do know it is led by something greater. It's led by a vision. By a future. Do you know what always puzzled me about the death of Abel? That would be fascinating to hear. It's how surprised God is that it happened. Why would an omniscient, omnipotent being be so shocked that the murder had occurred? Unless, of course... It was not an omnipotent being, not omniscient, or it was planned, it was predetermined. And if the mark of Cain was predetermined, then our conversation right now was as well. And neither of us has had any choice in how we came to be here. Asher takes a deep breath in through his nose and is going to try and use his bloodhound ability to detect the resonance of this man's blood if he is mortal or a ghoul. Okay. You breathe in. You smell nothing. It truly is fascinating what people in power can become so blind to. I do think that is a folly of man. But perhaps that is a bit of the key of it. <laughs> Sometimes folly brings brilliance. Sometimes folly, inevitability. What is it you want from me? From you? Forgiveness. At the end of it. We've been quarreling back and forth for the past little while. You and your friends. I wanted to assert that there was no pain in intention. It is simply that for us to find the glory of what is to come, that pain was inevitable. Am I tied to this chair? Uh, currently from behind your back, you're looking down, you can see that it is a, what seems to be a metal chair that looks like it has been haphazardly bolted into the actual stone. From there, you can see that there are metal chains that are uh, wrapping around your wrists, across your back. Then they go across your chest, and then they go across your legs. Uh, as Asher continues to talk, he's going to slice open his own palm and grab the chains that are binding his wrists and begin to use corrosive vitae okay uh i'll say make your make your first uh rouse check failure you're beginning to feel the bite of hunger as you're beginning to very slowly sizzle away at the first set of chains and that is three hunger for those keeping track damn okay which point, Father John just kind of looks to you. I am curious, Asher. I have heard through the grapevine that from your store, it's very lovely, by the way. Uh, you and Sebastian do a great job keeping up the place. I was curious, you hold a lot of religious texts. I was interested in your perspective on vampirism and divinity. Why? Well, there are plenty of works, texts, I mean, 
the Bible included, think Jesus of Nazareth offered his blood and his flesh to those around him as a means of power. Does that not seem interestingly reminiscent of ghoulish behavior? I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my fr flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. The last day. That's an interesting concept since from what i can tell it is you that are bringing about the last day in a sense i'm doing my duty and what duty is that if we are all to serve the lord and jesus our lord and jesus of kindred truly i believe we can say that enough evidence has been proven in our direction enough of from King, King Nebuchadnezzar himself. I find the day of revelation is not the apocalypse of which so many seek it to be. I believe it is simply a step. It is simply a point in which those who are slaves will come to understand their natural successors. Darwin said that it was evolution. <laughs> whatever you'd like, whatever definition. When were you born, Father John? Oh. <laughs> I guess it depends on your definition of born. When I was truly born, oh, it was a long time ago. I remember the 14th. Oh, no. 13th century then you know that darwinism is a fallacy glasses medicine that is not survival of the fittest that is innovation you could argue that it is the fitt fittest minds that continue but it is not the entire human species progresses off of the minds of a few your argument for darwinism is a fallacy it exists in animals are we not animals we are more than animals as are they is not the fundamental theory that beings with certain mutations that are let us forget about desirability. Because, like you say, that sort of Darwinism does not exist in the slightest. That was... <laughs> well, it was almost cute. The stupidity of some people. No, I mean survival mutations. Things that naturally ensure that someone lives or they die. Those who are better adapted to an environment will survive. Those who fail will die. Such is the natural state of things. If we were meant only to survive, we wouldn't have to trouble ourselves with human morality, ethics, emotion. And yes, perhaps some of my elders and yours struggle to access those things. But it doesn't mean that they aren't there. Yet we do scrape by just to survive. I mean, I was able to seek out help of dealing with that, I don't mean this to sound harsh, but paltry example of leadership that you once had. Drop of a hat had so many people interested. I had enough to bring the city of our community to its knees. Mortals are adapting in the same way that we are. They fear us because we are change. 
We are not the change. We have never been the change. We stay the same. Forever. It is mortals that encourage us to change. If it were only us, there would be nothing. We are tied so fundamentally to their world. And it is something that most of our kind ignores. But convince me. Sway me to your side. Clearly that's why I'm here. Otherwise you would have just gotten rid of me. Contrary to what you may think, Asher, I don't want any of our kind dead. Some just... sway the hand forward. Uh, please make another rouse check for your uh, Corrosive Vitae. Success. Okay. At this point, you can feel most of your hands have become free. You're a little bit concerned about if you continue to corrode them right now you think that if you you have them at a corroded enough state that if you were like to flex your arms or to throw yourself forward you think you could pop the chains if you corrode it much more the the links might fall slack revealing what is happening are there any gangrel in this room with us uh make a wits awareness check Three successes. Interesting. You do not see Gangro. You do sense two Nosferatu figures. Are either of them Ambrosia? Uh, one of them is not. Uh, the other one is familiar, however. Uh, you do see Clarky standing nearby. Make a, uh, make a wits insight check. Damn it, Clarky. Five successes with a one of them's a messy crit. Clarky so desperately hates this, but doesn't know what to do. Uh, so Asher is okay with the chains falling slack around him. He just wants to be more comfortable. Uh, and turns to look at Clarky directly away from this man in the chair and he says did you ever buy that book on Japan I recommend it you look to Clarky as you see Bouchard just kind of looks back toward, towards him see Clarky just kind of looks to the two of you you know this one i have lived in this city for decades i know all of them well come here boy kind of motions clarky over clarky just kind of walks up and monsieur bouchard just kind of stands looks at him answer his question a book about japan i've never been uh yeah yeah it's um i i got like a like a travel guide but i realized that that it doesn't really work unless i'm like actually there um but then i i i, re I read an uh uh, 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 uh uh another small book about japan it seems it seems pretty cool i'm sure nakano will be thrilled to hear it assuming he is still alive they both are alive, I assume. Oh, they are. They, well, depending on your definition of okay, are in different straits of being, you could say. It seems that uh, Talison is more of a firecracker than usual. It's been one of those days, and I couldn't help but notice... Your little name drop. Is Sebastian alive? Oh, yes, of course. Yes. No, Sebastian's doing fine. He, uh... He had a lot of things to work through. But... 
in fairness, that's... It's one of the things I missed. Seeing how the church operates now. Confession. It's something important. Being able to tell what's on your heart. Asher's eyes flash momentarily into a frenzy before he comes back to himself, not quite understanding the meaning behind what this man is saying, but knowing that confession can only mean so many things. And he's going to snap the chains. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to make a quick check here. As you rise up from from the seat, sl uh, at least slightly, you feel the bottom half of your body still slightly restrained as you break your arms free. You hear a like a almost like a thumping sound from the far corner as you feel something <coughs> impact you in the chest again. As you feel this, your body slouch forward as you see. Another one of these stakes as the Nosferatu steps out with the crossbow having leveled forward. As you see, Bouchard just kind of looks to you. You see, confession is important in the same way that therapy is important. It's opening your mind to possibility. It is listening, feeling. And understanding that there is a greater message in it all. Uh, I would like you to please make a intelligence plus resolve check. Six successes. As he's talking to you, you feel something in the back of your head. Almost this... This fear, this anxiety, growing within you. This wondering if perhaps you're wrong about this. I mean, Talison and Nakano, they're not here. Which means, did they fail? If he's saying that they're alive, is it just a trick or... Or are they really not here to save you? And it's... As that sensation kind of percolates only for a moment, you realize its influence. It coming from Bouchard as you're able to force the influence of his words out from your mind. As he just continues to look at you. I want you to see what we're creating here. Because it will be something beautiful. I hope that you will enjoy it when you see it. Sometimes beautiful things require... Require for some things to burn. But Cain can make this world right again. Just wait and see. He just looks over to Clarky. So, what do you think of all this, Clarky? Um, I, you know, I think, <laughs> I think it's pretty wild. Is that so? At which point, Father John just looks, Clarky just kind of nods. I suppose it is wild. Kind of takes a few steps heading towards the doorway. As Clarky just kind of looks to you. Oh! Clarky. Clarky just kind of turns around to him. <coughs> as Clarky just <coughs> hits the ground. Fire beginning to percolate around the center of his forehead. As 
John just holds the pistol outwards. As I said, no joy. Slips it in his back, uh, essentially in the back of his pants. Looks to the other one. Clean this up. I just continue to sit there then. That is where we're going to end off tonight's session. Thank you so much for listening. Right off the hop is, uh, <laughs> for the two of you, is there anything you'd like to plug? Get your vaccines. Guys, been another, been another big spike in, uh, in, in Brisbane. I realize when I say big spike, that is, uh, by Brisbane standards, which is not very big compared to the rest of the world, but, uh, we've been put into lockdown again. Not very pleasant. So yeah, please everyone get your vaccinations, get your jab so we can kick this bloody COVID out the window. Yeah. As per usual, I will plug uh, the other podcast I'm part of, October Jones and Fish with Legs, and all ages comedy, fantasy, narrative podcast that's just a lot of fun, really great world building and characters, and some very nice villains, one of whom is played by a familiar voice to listeners of this show. Um, I would absolutely recommend it. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, as well as our Facebook page, uh, our Twitter page, our Instagram page, and our official website, which is octoberandfish.ca, not octoberandfish.com. As I have said in previous episodes, I am very sorry. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you all so very much for listening. Make sure to get all of your board game news from thebagofloot.com as well as episodes of this series. Plus, also get all your board game needs at threekingsloot.com. If you want more content like this, make sure to check us out, Three Kings Loot on YouTube and The Bag of Loot on Facebook uh, for our little section here, The Rook and the Rascal. Thank you all so much, and we'll catch you next time. This podcast is possible because of viewers like you. The story, all names, characters, and incidents portrayed in this production are fictitious. No identification with actual persons living or deceased, places, buildings, and products is intended or should be inferred. Thank you.